कभी करती हैं मुलाकातें कभी करती हैं मुलाकातें कभी यादों में बरसाते किताबें करती हैं बातें किताबें करती हैं बातें मन की गहरी झील में कूद जाती हैं कभी सोच के दरिया के संग संग बहती जाती हैं कभी चाहे शाम हो या हो रातें किताबें करती हैं बातें वेलकम टू किताब नामा बुक्स एंड बियॉन्ड टुडे we are uh, we are focusing on children's literature and our two guests are manisha choudhury editorial head pratham books and anushka ravi shankar director duckbill books welcome first manisha you have um, been in publishing for many years how did you get into children's literature i started in publishing in the 80s uh, and i worked with india's first feminist publishing house and it seems really silly to say uh, that i moved from women to children but that is actually what happened because i started off with uh, looking at feminism and i got involved with uh, many development issues and at some point when i had my own children i became aware of a category of human being which is a child and i realized that i was reading to these two children that i had and then i realized the importance of uh, children's literature in any child's growing up and it so happened that uh, an ngo called pratham was also seriously looking at reading uh, for children at the time and pratham books got established and since it was a multilingual publishing house and multi- multilingualism has al- always been uh, something that i've thought about and i've i've been concerned about and it seemed to all come together in the fact that pratham books was a multilingual children's publishing house so that's how i started in children's literature what about you because you are also an established children's writer right i i kind of wandered into it in a in a strange way because i always wrote right so i like to write uh, i like to write stories and things but it was again when my daughter was about 6 or 7 and we were looking for books for her and i realized that there was a huge gap in the market there weren't enough books for indian children about indian children based in indian context there were a few but not uh, by far not enough because uh, so and since i liked writing i started trying to write some stories and you know sent them off to tinkle and this and that and i didn't know whether i could do it i didn't know whether would, you know whether they would work but apparently they did and then i joined tara uh, publishing as an editor and that's when i actually started you know getting really involved in children literature and tara was doing some fabulous work then so i was really lucky to be part of that Uh, early that whole, days. Yeah, the early days of, uh, yeah, of you know, small independent children's publishers. So, have you seen any marked changes in children's literature and children's publishing in India um, over the say the last decade and a half? In the nineties, ni- mid nineties is when I joined Tara and all that, and the, there was already that shift b- happening because Tara Tulika. all of them had started doing really well produced beautiful children's books w- which hadn't been done before because until then you didn't see that quality of uh, children's books in india katha also mm. was around the same time and you started seeing these really beautiful books the problem then was that people found them too expensive because uh, obviously it costs money to produce books of that quality so that was the biggest problem we had in those days that everyone used to say they're so expensive but now you find that again now you find that there are a lot of publishers doing you know really well produced books and also different genres and there's definitely a difference in both the quality of production and the quality of uh, you know the writing and everything and there's more variety pratham is doing some fabulous work i think with the multilingual yeah. books manisha with it's i mean with pratham books also and with other things what are the changes that you've seen is is it is it just multilingual and format or is there something else no i uh, i completely agree with anushka that uh, there has been a vast improvement in how we look at children's literature in the first place and i think uh, the the pioneers in that field such as tulika tara and uh, katha and others uh, have definitely had a huge role to play in terms of 
the kind of picture books that we are producing uh, or the kind of um, stories that we are happy to look at for young adults. Whereas earlier there were, I mean, these categories were kind of there in the market, but nobody uh, looked at them as a niche, which was very important. And as far as picture books go, I think in the languages other than English, uh, that is still a genre which needs a large amount of work because in many of the Indian languages, there are not enough picture books for children. And anybody who's concerned with children's literature will tell you that you have to start with picture books. And uh, you know, if you have to get children reading at the earlier stages, unless you have good picture books, it's very difficult to get them to start reading. So I think that has been, uh, that has been a learning curve for everybody yeah. in the industry in that sense. Is that why you've um, sort of collaborated and uh, launched your new imprint, Adi Kahani? Is well, Adi Kahani is actually, uh, you know, it's, it's like the culmination of uh, a long journey where we wanted to do picture books in as many Indian languages as possible. And uh, tribal languages, uh, if they don't have a script because of the whole, uh, uh, you know, distinction that is made between an official language and a non-official language, a spoken language and a written language, uh, uh, the, the tribal languages were completely ignored as far as children's literature was concerned, even though we all know that all tribal cultures have a vast number of songs and riddles and um, stories for children. Now, to transition them into print uh, is something which requires a little bit of process-oriented work. So, uh, while we were doing many of the mainstream Indian languages, this was our first attempt to include tribal languages in that as well. And that was a sort of natural progression from the fact that uh, uh, there's 97% enrollment of children of the school-going age in schools today and many of them are tribal children. And they have absolutely no books uh, no, which reflect true. their milieu or which are in their language. Mm. So in Adi Kahani, uh, we were sort of conscious of this fact and we were lucky to have an on-ground partner who, were, you know, who was already uh, working in the area of early childhood education and we collaborated uh, to have a workshop with first-time authors who were tribals themselves and who were working with children. So Adi Kahani really came out of that uh, rather complicated process but a very rewarding one. You were going to say something. No, I was just, I mean, we've gone away from that, but I was just about to say that the other thing that happened around the same time was Karadi Tales who were doing audio books. Yeah, I was just going to mention Karadi. And that, that became, you know, I think that really worked because you find a whole generation of kids who say that their first, the first books that they read were the Karadi Tales books because the audio thing really helped and parents loved, loved it because, you know, they, did, they, they had somebody reading out the book as well. So that really worked. Mm -hmm. Now we have, a various kinds of digital formats for children's literature. That's another way in which the, this uh, genre, this niche area has evolved. Do you think digital publishing, and in this I will include all formats, I will not restrict it only to audio or e or whatever, we'll just use it as that. Do you think it has, uh, has enriched children's publishing in any way or has it been disruptive as many per would like to see it? I don't think it's substantial enough yet to be disruptive or enriching, honestly. I mean, there are, uh, we do all our books at Duckbill, we do all our books as e-books, but the sales of e-books is n pretty much negligible right now. The f digital format, there's, there's a difference between an, a regular e-book and a digital yeah. book which has been created in a way that it, you know, uses the medium in the best way possible. There's not much of that happening. I no. don't. Yeah. So it's not not yet enough to to make any kind of uh, difference really yet. What but it will get there, I think. Does Pratham Books uh, go into e formats? Uh, actually, we are looking at uh, uh, digital formats very seriously. Uh, partly because at some point in our life, uh, as Pratham Books, we decided to embrace Creative Commons yeah. hmm. to allow for books uh, which can be downloaded freely by anybody and. Uh, retranslated, repurposed, remixed, even resold and repriced. Because uh, being a not-for-profit, we have that uh, advantage where we uh, really measure what we do in terms of the number of children that we reach rather than the revenue that we have to earn. Uh, so once our Creative Commons book started going up uh, in, a, in a format that people could download, we found that you know we've had 200,000 downloads in 80 countries. You know, that sounds like a really big number, but I mean, we do need to do the analytics of who's actually downloading, who's remixing, and what sort of child is benefiting from that. But looking at uh, how a digital format or a, a freely downloadable format 
allows the book to travel very much further than a physical book possibly can because of various physical constraints. We are actually going to be uh, putting up a story platform from next year onwards where we are going to have as many uh, free books uh, up for free download as well as um, inviting as many authors and illustrators who want to uh, be seen and read and we'll, uh, it'll have the facility of uh, mixing, repurposing and so on. So we are looking at digital as being ready for the future and we're also looking at digital as an alternative mode of delivery. So just like a, a paper book is, is, is required for a child who's just entering school, if going forward, if there is going to be connectivity all across the country, uh, there is no reason why we should not use that format to reach as many children as possible in a cheaper way. So uh, we are, I mean, like Anushka says, it is fairly nascent right now. It's, it's uh, you know, it's the market is probably not developed enough or it's, one doesn't have enough indicators of how big it is going to be. But then again, if you look at the number of children who are in the reading age, uh, there is no reason why it should not take off in a big way. In terms of um, children's books and children's illustrations and children's literature, the, the, the younger generation is coming up. They are so apt at being in this ecosystem, this combined, you know, of combined mediums mm -hmm. that who are we beyond a point to yeah, say I, the, what I is the no, I do believe them. that you know they you know? can yeah. coexist because yeah. it's like when, when television came everybody said people are going to stop reading but people did not stop reading no. right so it is quite clearly uh, something that the human brain can process multiple uh, media and especially like you're saying the younger generation because they are born with so much electronic media around them you do find that they're able to navigate through multiple media quite uh, quite easily quite easily yeah. as a publisher when you come when you work on stories do you work on uh, with stories and say okay it'll work in this language but do you also think in terms of how well it'll translate how well it'll go into languages does that work with for you um yes and no <laughs> because uh, you know the publishing industry is uh, is kind of dominated by the english language uh, internationally uh, in india if i look at english and hindi then i would say hindi and english are the dominant languages so therefore the average author who submits to me is usually an English writer. Uh, so the sensibility willy-nilly is uh, coming from a, from a different space altogether. So there are certain universal themes which will obviously translate well. But uh, I am actually proud of do having done an Adi Kahani which reverses that flow of information from the margins to the center because otherwise, you know, very often we tend to think that we are bringing people into the mainstream mm -hmm. merely by the act of translating an English book into their language and therefore somehow they're assimilated into the mm -hmm. mainstream. I know these are sort of deba hugely debatable issues about what is the mainstream, what is the margin, who needs to be brought where and for what reason. But the but fact that these, uh, yeah. these, these issues are being raised so many years on yeah. earlier on we didn't even address, address them in children's okay. literature right. we just assumed children's yes. literature yes. for children had to be my mythology based didactic mm -hmm. and and the epics regurgitated. As publishers uh, primarily in the English language for us our, our readership is different from theirs so it's obviously going to be like the, our writers are essentially English language writers so what but I feel that we also have a different function uh, to perform in this whole thing you know such a divisive society in so many ways so on the one hand we need them uh, children of uh, you know underprivileged children or marginalized children to have books to read the same way that our kids have but on the other hand, I think it's also very important for our kids to, by, by our kids I mean urban, you know, English speaking kids mostly, um, to to be sensitized to other, you know, to children mm. who are less privileged or who are less visible than them. Yeah. Mm. I think that's really important and that, that is a function that I think we can do, you know, which is that make sure that our books uh, include different kinds of children. So we kind of do we try and do that. We try and do that consciously. We like we have books in which you you don't find enough of those books. I think. For exam uh, example, one thing is what we did at Tara was trash, rag yeah. on rag picker children. If you remember that book, it was, uh, and the, the thing about the book was that um, it w we were very careful not to make the children look like victims. You know, they had to be children first, so that the readers realize that they're children. And, and they're as children, they're coeval to them and they're like them in, so in more ways than they're unlike them. I think that's a very important thing. At, at Dugbill, we have done a couple of books like that, like uh, Flat Track Bullies, mm. which includes children, which is about this boy who goes and plays with children on the streets. And it talks in a very nice way about, you know, 
about the relationship between these, you know, it's, it's complicated, right? The, children, the kind of relationships that our kids have with the kids of, say, people who work in our homes and all that. So, so those, those are areas that we feel need to be dealt with very sensitively. I don't think people in their normal uh, daily lives in, uh, deal with those things sensitively. But it's assuming that these books are easily available, readily available, and that the target audience, that the readership is willing to take them on, you know, and is willing to read them. How does, I mean, because sometimes ch children, I mean, children and young adults are becoming quite discerning, right. aren't they? So I think children and young adults will read a story that's well told. So the important Ultimately. thing is also not to hammer these things into them. They have to be kind of integral to the story. So there's no point putting these things in just because you think children should learn these things, which is never the right way to do it. So it has to be integral to the story. And if the story is well told, then these get assimilated in a much easier and nicer way. Your motto is put a book in every child's hand, isn't that's right. it? That's right, yeah. And, and it's also to, um, go across languages. How many languages do you work in? Uh, after we've done the tribal books, now 16. So that is more or less at par with what the National Book Trust does, doesn't it? It's really not the number uh, always, Jaya. It's also, uh, I think uh, what Anushka is talking about is a very important thing, which is that because we live in a divisive society, all of us somewhere are purposive in how we look at children's literature. Exactly. I have I to be even to more purposive because I am, you know, primarily keeping the disadvantaged child in mind who may have a greater struggle in the very act of reading which a urban middle class child may or may not have. Um, so given that, I think all these things are uh, the things that we have to keep in our awareness when we are commissioning, when we are looking at mm -hmm. books, when we are looking at what should go yeah. after children. However, it's it's very important also not to be didactic and uh, uh, say that you know we have to give them all these good messages because here are these empty vessels waiting to be uh, but filled by us. With children's publishing today in two in two thousand fourteen, and if we map it from say when it say about the last twenty odd years, twenty odd years there has been uh, there has been a proliferation in a sense of children's publishers who are catering to different uh, readerships and and uh, things and finally i think we're coming to a stage where we have a variety of books a variety of formats we have children's publishers um, catering only to audiobooks or e formats at least that is something which, uh, and, and with Duckbill Books, for instance, doing their series, doing their No War series, which I like very much, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which I like very much, which is just focused on conflict, ch children surviving in conflict zones, mm -hmm. you know. Pratham Books doing Adhikani. These are the innovative experiments which are, which are, which I think I finally have a space. I agree. You know, and have a say which we, we didn't happen earlier. Okay. Thank you very much. F and uh, for coming to Kitab Nama and it's ple been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Veena Venugopal and I have just published this book called The Mother-in-Law, The Other Woman in Your Marriage. I will read out a little bit of the book uh, for you. Uh, the book is essentially a collection of 11 stories of mothers-in-law from across the country. Let's begin. In the last year, I spoke to scores of women about their mothers-in-law. The stories I heard were so insane and so weird that my own account of mummy seemed like fluff. Most of the time, my story merely ended up annoying the listener, like when thin people say they don't diet and are just genetically disposed to be skinny. From Kolkata to Mumbai and Delhi to Chennai, I met women who occupied some part point of the cliché scale with their mothers-in-law. No matter who you talk to, new brides, old wives, Hindu, Christian, Muslim, Anglo-Indian, just about every married Indian woman is engaged in close combat with her mother-in-law. Their stories just needed the slightest prod to bubble up to the surface. Get a bunch of married women together, any bunch, and simply say, goodness, you won't believe my mother-in-law, then shut up and listen. Out come stories of control, betrayal, and harassment. After the first few meetings, I stopped being surprised by the fact that everyone seemed to have a dispute with their mothers-in-law. 
But what continued to shock me was how intensely damaged a lot of these relationships were. Most daughters-in-law, it seemed to me, were huddled at the extreme end of the cliche scale. Within minutes, minutes of posting a Facebook request asking if someone knew anyone who had had a typical arranged marriage, yes, that was the only qualifier I published since I did not want to reveal the reason why I was asking. Not only did I find someone who had taken the matrimonial advertisement horoscope route to marriage, but one who had a mother-in-law so rotten, just listening about her gave me a migraine. It can't be, I kept hearing myself say. It just cannot be so easy, but it was. And I'm sure if I'd cast my net a little wider, I would have heard stories that would have given me not just a migraine, but a whole brain tumor. It's true, a monster mother-in-law is a national affliction. Even women who told me they were lucky to have a decent mother-in-law often proceeded to recount a really bad story about their mamiji. That's how bad the situation is. Mother-in-law maladies are neither new nor are they restricted to India. In the West, the mother-in-law is an endless subject of jokes. But in South Asia, even in popular culture, the mother-in-law has traditionally, traditionally been a source of much angst and villainy. Yet, the more people I talked to, the more it seemed to me that in India, the mother-in-law dynamic has worsened over the years. We now live in a society that was unimaginable 20 years ago. There is no doubt that our lives have improved since 1991. Economic liberalization brought with it social liberalization too. We have a surfeit of options and ample liberty in choosing what we wear, the kind of degrees we want to pursue and the kind of places we'd like to visit. We are far more open, liberated, and in control of all aspects of our lives. The only exception to me seems to be our, our relationship with our mothers-in-law. In the last 20 years, there has been an utter breakdown in the Mamiji daughter-in-law dynamic. In urban India, pretty much all daughters-in-law across all demographics are more educated than they were 20 years ago. The middle class daughter has been raised with the notion that she's capable of doing everything that her brother is. They've been educated with a career in mind. And when they graduate, a large majority of women seek employment. If they work in fields like IT, it is more likely that they, have not, that they travel abroad on projects. So when they're ready to get married at, an, at 24 on an average or 25, they have lived a bit, formed their opinions, and decided on their choices. Mamiji, however, is still stuck at Mughal Azam. She has raised her daughter to be independent and liberal because that was the cue she got from others around her. She thinks of the freedom she allows her daughter as a short vacation. She constantly tells her daughter that she shouldn't expect to be allowed to behave in a modern fashion once she gets married and goes to her husband's home. And she hasn't thought about how liberated her daughter-in-law should be. She assumes the husband's home is the place where cultural control is maintained. So even compared to her own daughter, she tends to have stricter rules for the daughter-in-law. That right there is the reason why this is the worst generation for Mamiji conflicts. Daughters-in-law who expect to live modern, post-liberalized lives are finding themselves stuck with pre-liberalized Mamijis. Expectations are asymmetric. It is a mismatch made in hell. This is the reason why we were watching Ye Jo Hai Zindagi in TV in 1989, and we are watching one or the other descendant of Kyuki Saas B Kabi Bahuti now. The very construct of the mother-in-law relationship is lopsided. It is built to be awkward. This can be gleaned just from the nomenclature. In North India, mothers-in-law are often called mamiji. If mother-in-law were mummy, it would imply that the daughter-in-law could interact with her with the intimacy and honesty that a relationship with mummy implies. The G in mamiji forces respect, decorum, and a definite imbalance in the power structure of the relationship. Perhaps daughters-in-law are much better off addressing mamiji as auntie G. That way, they aren't forcing the baggage of unconditional maternal love. At best, you expect auntie G to be polite and friendly. At worst, you expect her to be distant and indifferent. With mummy, you expect tolerance and affection. Then the G gets stuck on and all you get is unmitigated authority and unadulterated bitchiness. Drowned as I was deeply in stories of many mummijis and their villainy, it took me entirely by surprise to run into a forum that actually seeks to protect them. The All India Mother-in-Law Protection Forum is the first ever social forum created to protect the rights and interests of the mother-in-law. 
It is a non-funded, non-profit organization which will create awareness about the problems faced by mothers-in-law and also fight against the de facto villainous projection in the social legal arena, claims its website. One mellow Thursday morning, I call the helpline listed on the site. A lady who introduces herself, introduces herself as Mrs. Manjeet Puri answers the phone. Mrs. Puri does not have much patience with rogue daughters-in-law. She gets three or four calls every day, she tells me, from harassed mothers-in-law. Most of them are accused of violence against their daughters-in-law. In India, this falls under the Section 498 of the Penal Code and is not an immediately bailable offence. But what worries Mrs. Puri now is the number of calls she receives from abroad. Countries like the USA, UK and Australia are teeming with scared they see mothers-in-law worried about being imprisoned in a strange la land on the sheer basis of a phone call that the daughter-in-law makes to the police. The daughter-in-law just has to say that my mother-in-law is making me do odd jobs around the house and not letting me take up a job in the office. That's all that is required. The cops haul the poor mother-in-law off to jail, she tells me. But because they're so far away and governed by the laws of another country, concerned and sympathetic as she is, Mrs. Puri is unable to help them. Over, a, over my years of research, a lot of people told me that I was paying excessive attention to a non-problem, that this whole Mamiji myth was a media creation. These people were usually Mamijis themselves, or men, or people who have never read newspapers. Truth is, the Mamiji issue is so big in this country that it took the biggest court to drill some sense. In May 2013, the Supreme Court had this to say, the crux of this statement in a case uh, the Supreme Court lawyer said, the judge said, a daughter-in-law to be is, is to be treated as a family member, not a housemaid. What kind of a non-problem requires advice from the Supreme Court? For the moment, let's keep aside what this implies the court thinks of housemaids. A daughter-in-law should be treated with warmth and affection and not as a stranger with respectable and ignoble indifference. It is a pity that the court did not define warmth and affection. In the same judgment, the court also observed that marriage and life with in-laws leave many daughters-in-law with no desire to leave.